coming for the throne. Throne marshmallow. Me and you, we'll fucking bang it. It's a big old white squishy. Yeah, well, hitting him is like hitting a steel beam. Sometimes they hurt. And you remember that. And then you go chasing those white, fussy, fluffy things that make you feel good inside. You walk alone into a room and you find a chessboard. Each of the 64 squares has a coin sitting on top of sure it. It does. And taking a step back, this is going to be one of those classic prisoner puzzles where a strangely math obsessed warden Ooh, offers like, you good. and a fellow inmate a chance for freedom, but only if the two of you solve some elaborate scheme that they've laid out. In this case, what they've done is carefully turned over each of the coins to be heads or tails according to whatever pattern they want it to be, and then they show you a key. They put that key inside one of the chessboard squares. Under each each square is a secret compartment or something like that. So you know where the key is. And the goal is going to be to get prisoner number two to also know where the key is. But the only thing that the warden allows you to do before you leave the room is to turn over one well, and only one doing, of these coins. Do right here? I don't know. Heisenberg, you step in. At that point, somewhere. you walk out, your fellow prisoner walks in, and with no information other than the set of heads and tails that they're looking at, which you've only barely tweaked, they're supposed to deduce uh, where uh, the key can, is hidden. It can do this. Potentially I'm winning freedom for the both world. of you. As is typical with these this. puzzles, the two of you can strategize ahead of time if you want, but you won't know what the specific layout of heads and tails is. Oh, this should moreover, be my submission for you. The can listen in on your strategy uh, and do their absolute best to thwart it with some adversarial arrangement of the coins and the, the key. newspaper, right? In the stock market. So, I first heard about this puzzle job, over dinner conversation job, actually at a wedding, and it just totally job. sucked me in. I remember the drive home was maybe three hours. And, and I think my mind was glued next. to the topic of flipping coins and encoding state that whole time. But the puzzle sticks with you even after that. Well, after I solved it, I fell into these two surprisingly in interesting world. rabbit holes. One was to prove that the challenge is actually impossible if you vary the setup a little bit, maybe making it a 6x6 six six chessboard, or maybe removing one of the squares. And to give you a little and sense for where that rabbit hole leads, this video is going to end with an especially pleasing way to paint the corners of a four-dimensional cube. What it will do. The other rabbit hole know. was to work no, out how closely you can connect the solution of this puzzle with error correction, it's going to be which is a or, super uh, yeah, important topic Einstein in computer science and Hubble information Einstein theory. Being the idea is that when did, computers send and did, store data, did you grab the messiness of the real world inevitably flips a bit now and then. And that can completely you change how the data bit. is read. You get to play in a so error correcting codes well, are a way to add a shockingly small amount of information really to a message. It makes it possible for the receiver to identify both when there is an error, an error an and more impressively, now, precisely how to fix it. It turns out that bit? the intuition yeah, for solving this puzzle bit. is essentially and the same as the intuition behind these things but called it's hemming to cuts, how much which are I one of the earliest examples of, of highly efficient error correction. Has an which is all to say, time spent mulling over this problem some of is not as useless as you might me, think it is. What is the now, you and I aren't actually going to go through the solution here. What is Instead, close I filmed a video all about that on Stand Up Maths with Matt Parker, who I'm sure many of you recognize from his combined YouTube and Stand Up and Book fame. We each talk through our thoughts process and solving it, and it's good fun, because there are you multiple ways of looking at it. Instead, what I want to do with you here is take a more global view of every possible strategy for this puzzle, and bring you with me down that first rabbit hole of proving why certain variations necessarily leave room for the warden to thwart you, no matter how clever you are. This twister theory the proof itself there. is one of those satisfying moments where you shift perspective and it reveals the solution. And the whole context leading up to so it is a nice chance to practice reasoning about higher dimensional objects as a way to draw conclusions about information and data. Plus, it does more to help you appreciate Those, the solution to the original puzzle part, when you can see how it is, in a sense, piece. almost impossible. Where to start? What we want is some kind of visualization for what it even means to solve this puzzle. And to build up to the general case, Director let's knock things down to the simplest case that we map. can that still has any kind of meaning to it. Under those two squares, limits. Is two it? coins, is it not? and two possibilities for where the key is. Could it be is. this? Is it time principled inside here? One way here that you could solve this is to simply let the second coin things, communicate where the certain, key is. Certain. If it's tails, it means the key is in the left square. If it's heads, it means the key and is in the right square. Operate. If it has not a big spin, deal, right? It's one bit of information. So when you need to change that coin, you can flip it. But if you don't need to change it, you can just flip the other. We point. had a graft all the way down. First things first, let's stop Admiral. thinking about these as heads Statue. and tails and start <laughs> thinking of them as ones and zeros. 
that's much easier to do math with. Then you can think of these pairs of coins as a set of coordinates, where each of the four possible states that the board can be in sit at the corners of a unit square, like this. I love this computer. might feel like a silly thing I to do. do when we already know how to solve this case, but it's a good warm-up for turning the larger cases into a kind of geometry. It's, it's, Notice, this is a little bit flipping on the one of the coins because moves this you along an edge of the square, and since it's, dumb, it's only changing and one of the coordinates. Uh, Our strategy of letting that second coin encode the key location could be drawn by associating the bottom two corners, where the y coordinate is zero, with the key is this underscore zero the state. Go fucking bury it, man. Can find Which it. means those top two corners are associated with the bracket. key is underscore one state. So think about what it means for our solution to actually Bob work. Reed remover. It means that Board no matter where you start, if you're forced to take a step along an edge, forced to flip one of the coins, you can always guarantee that you end up in whichever of these two regions you want to. Yeah, go to the casino. It's like if I get good at Texas Hold'em. Now maybe. the question is, if what does it look like for a bigger chess board? Card poker, the next simplest case would be three squares, three coins, three possibilities for where the key is. Oh, it gets fucking wild in there. But is that gravity? Is it not gravity? What are they this doing? This gives us eight possible states that the coin can be in. For pitch or playing the same game that we did before, positions. interpreting these states as coordinates, it brings us up into three-dimensional space, with each state sitting at the corner of a unit cube. The usefulness in a picture like this is that it gives a very vivid meaning to the idea of turning over one of the coins. Every time you flip a coin, you're this walking the along the edge flower. of a cube. I'm telling you. Yeah. There's a garden over here. Now, what would it mean for you and your fellow inmate to have a strategy for this puzzle? Whenever Prisoner 2 walks into that room, they need to be able to associate the state that they're looking at, three bits now basically, you know with one of three Mark possible one. squares. Go. We're already thinking very visually, so let's associate those squares with colors. Maybe red for square zero, green for square no, one, and blue for no square bad, two. But you, you In this conception, be able to coming up with a strategy, any possible strategy, like, do, is the same so many, thing yeah, as coloring so many each of the eight corners of the cube, either red, green, or blue. throwing darts at the phone book about mathematicians and throw up this and so one example, half the key. Let's say you colored the uh, whole cube red. Well, I don't know if you'd call this a strategy exactly, but it would correspond with always guessing that the key is under square zero. Let's say instead your strategy was to add the first two coins together and use that as an encoding for the key location. Yes, I have my own. Well, then the cube would look I'll like this. show you this. what it looks like. People would call you crazy. What's kind of fun is well, we can count how many total strategies TV exist. Right here, red, with green, three blue, choices for the color of each vertex and doing eight some total stuff vertices, real deep we get three here. to the power eight. Or, wow. if you're yeah, comfortable Thomas, letting your mind M1, stray to the M2, thought of painting a 64-dimensional cube, X, y, and Z, you can have fun thinking out, about X the sense in which there are 64 systems, to the two to the 64 on graphs, total possible like, strategies for the original puzzle. It would be this is the size of the haystack, when you're looking for the needle. On this graph. Well, that wasn't really Another attempt what for the three-square case day, might look like taking 0 times coin 0, plus 1 times coin 1, plus 2 times coin 2, and then reduce that sum mod 3 if you need to. Over on Stand Up Maths, Matt and I both talk about trying a version of this for the 64 square case, and why it works decently well for a random arrangement of coins, but why it's ultimately doomed. From our view over here, it just looks like one more way to color the cube. But it's worth taking a moment to walk through some of those corners. Let's say that you get into the room, and all three coins are set to tails. So it's like you're starting at the corner 0, 0, 0. If you were to flip coin 0, that doesn't change the sum, so it takes you to another red corner. If you flipped coin 1, it increases the sum by 1, so it takes you to a green corner. And flipping coin 2 takes you up to 2, which looks like a blue corner. The fact that you always have access to whichever color you want is a reflection of the fact that this strategy will always win if this is the corner that you're starting on. On the other hand, let's say that you started yeah, at zero, 010. Zero. Doing something different. Well, in that yeah. case, flipping coin zero really? takes you to another green corner, since it doesn't change the sum. Yeah, isn't your woman doing something but in the box? But flipping either coin one or so coin two with me all the damn happened time. to take you to a red corner. There's simply no way to get to a blue corner. <laughs> Basically, what's happening here is that you have the yeah, options to subtract out. one by to turning off coin one, yeah. or to add two by turning on coin two. And if you're working mod 3, those are both actually the same operation. Mm. But that means that there's no way to change the sum to be 2. An adversarial warden who knows your strategy could start with this configuration, put the key under square no, 2, yeah. and no, call it done. Shit. 
but even without thinking about sums mod 3 or anything like that, whatever the implementation details, you can see this in our picture manifested as a corner that has two neighbors of the same color. If you don't have a bird's eye view of all possible strategies, when you find that any specific one of them just doesn't work, you're left to wonder, okay, maybe there's a sneaky, clever strategy that I just haven't thought of yet. Okay, so back but to the map. But when you're thinking about pieces, colors we'll on the cube, you're naturally you know led to an Unsended. interesting combinatorial is question. Ranger territory, is there some huh? way that you can paint this so that the three neighbors of any given you know, vertex always represent this is red, green, and blue? What that does, this always happens. This kind of, eh, special. Maybe it seems bizarre, nice. even you have convoluted, around. to go Keep from a puzzle with chessboards and coins to talking about painting corners of a cube. But this is actually a much more natural step than you might expect. Do, I've talked with a lot of people about this puzzle, this and what I love is, is that many of the experienced yeah, problem solvers immediately jump unprompted whatever, to talking about yeah, astronaut, coloring the corners of a cube, a as if it's a kind of de facto whatever. language for this puzzle. And it really is. Thinking about binary strings would, as vertices right, of a high-dimensional cube, with bit flips corresponding they to totally edges, perfect bit. that Sometimes actually comes up a lot, especially in coding theory, like the error correction stuff I referenced earlier. What's more, you often hear mathematicians talk about coloring things as right. a way to describe partitioning bar, 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 them bar, bar, into distinct bar. sets. And I ain't talking about if shots you've ever heard games. of that hilariously enormous number grams constant, for example, the problem game. where that came up was also phrased in terms of assigning colors to a high-dimensional cube. Sitting out there. Yep. So in that case, area. colors were given to right, pairs of vertices instead of individual ones. The point is, analyzing how to color a high-dimensional cube is more of a transferable skill than That's you right. might expect. Just a rock. So to our question, Being a rock. can you make it so that One every straight. vertex has a red, a green, and a blue neighbor? And these are all Remember, business this is the same thing as having an encoding for rock. key locations yeah. so that you're always one flip away from communicating whichever location you want to. It would actually be enlightening if you paused the video and tried this now. No it's like a weird three-dimensional no variant of a Sudoku. No Very similar ever to Sudoku, in, in fact, now. in the sense that you want certain subsets to be filled with all three possible states. For example, you might start by painting one of the corners an arbitrary color, let's say red, yeah, the so you know that its three neighbors need mistake. to be red, green, and blue, doesn't really matter how you do it. And then maybe we move to the red neighbor and say that the, the other two adjacencies course. need to be yes. green yeah, and blue, house. maybe we do it's it like this. Mansions. But at least how I've drawn it here, Jump on you're stuck. It. You are unable I mean, to choose like a correct color robot, for the next two. Do Can you see why? Sometimes what you I'd like to share is a lovely little argument that explains not only why this will day. never work in three dimensions, but also why it can't work in any dimension that's not a power of two. The idea is that the symmetry in the property that we're looking the program at of the AR will end up implying that there have to be an equal here. number it's of red, green, and blue vertices. To a but that build. would mean just that the there's eight thirds of each, which is not possible. Knocks, it's a business and before principle. I go on, Gotta do the knocks, pause, we'll eventually see if you get can think of a way to solidify that sure intuition. The is an it's a fun exercise in turning a vague instinct like, into a solid proof. It's got to work on a universal mount and some clips on some things, and it's pretty simple. I hear you say, hey, the intellectual property on that one. One way to do this is to imagine a process where you go through each corner, Very and you count down. how many of its like, neighbors well, are a particular color, know. say red. Can't disprove it nowadays. So hey, let me each step here, we'll we're out. looking at the three neighbors of a given right. vertex, counting up the red ones, and adding that to a total tally. For this specific coloring, that count came out to be 12, but if we had the property that we wanted, Every uh, corner would know, have you exactly don't one red you don't, so that count should be eight. Fifteen year olds on the other hand, with, like, or every fourteen year olds with the world record is counted for exactly is, three times. Is once great for each instance where it's somebody's neighbor. You wind up getting so that final like, tally has to be three IQ times the total number on. of red corners. They're supposed to be eating so, bugs. You know, it's simple to find a coloring where eight thirds of the corners are red. Isn't that nice? Counting how many times yeah, some sure. corner has a red neighbor fancy. is the same as counting how many times a red corner has some neighbor, and, neighbor. Uh, and that's actually enough to get us a contradiction. What's also nice is that this argument immediately generalizes to higher dimensions. Think about solving the chessboard puzzle with n squares. Again, the puzzle is to associate each we'll arrangement of coins yeah. with some state, <laughs> some possible location for the key. The goal is to make it so 